Okay, so the meeting is now live. If I can ask you just to uh, take your seats and um, pray silence. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for everyone coming today. Um, it's lovely to see what I imagine is the, the Leicester group of trainees here. You should be very proud of the output uh, of one of your consultant colleagues. Um, and those of you who can notice, I've got my Leicester tie on here. I was proudly given this a few years ago when I came down to teach you on an excellent rotation. Uh, it's lovely for me to see uh, my colleagues from the foot and ankle world um, after such a long period of time not seeing you. So um, my name is Mark Davis. I'm going to chair the session today. It gives me great privilege to come down um, from Sheffield to celebrate the launch of um, Mr. Batia's latest book because it is his third book and he's almost as prolific as J.K. Rowling. So um, I am really very impressed. Now, um, a few housekeeping tips here. Um, the fire exits are through there. So if you hear a fire alarm, it's not a practice. Uh, make your way out through those doors and into the car park, please. The lavatories are again through the right hand door um, and through the next set of doors and on the right hand side. Um, at the back of the room, you may notice that there are some uh, drinks and things that uh, will be for the canapes and drink session at the end. What we're going to ask you to do is to go at one table at a time just because of social distancing rules and um, take your uh, drinks, etc., back to your tables so that you can consume them there. Um, canapes will be served at the table. Um, can I ask you just to wear your masks when uh, you're in the auditorium at all times? Uh, the exception to that is if you're speaking, eating or drinking. Um, we're going to have all of the talks and at the end of the talks there will be the question and answer session. Uh, that will be from uh, members that are participating on Zoom, but also for everyone here in the room. There will be a microphone that will be placed down here in front of me. Um, and if you'd like to come and ask a question, can I ask you to come up one at a time and do so. So um, it gives me great pleasure to be here uh, today. And we can start uh, this book launch uh, with a plum. And we're going to start that with... Uh, an interview with Mr. Batia himself. I'd like to introduce Manish Batia, editor of the new Essentials of Foot and Ankle Surgery book. Manish, can you give us a snapshot of the book in your own words? Of course, thank you, Joe. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, for the launch of uh, Essentials of Foot and Ankle Surgery. Uh, and as the name suggests, uh, it covers almost everything you need to know in foot and ankle. Uh, it's a very comprehensive book. There are 22 chapters uh, contributed by 42 authors who have done an excellent job. Uh, the authors, the lead authors are masters of their fields. Um, there are over 500 colored illustrations, so the book is actually quite lively and you don't get bored or get very useful uh, information from the images. Uh, the book covers uh, almost all aspects, so right from clinical examination of foot and ankle to surgical anatomy and approaches, um, biomechanics, gait, orthotics, prosthetics, um, radiology, uh, pediatric foot and ankle, uh, adult, elective, trauma, everything is there. Um, and therefore, it's very suitable for uh, a registrar who is uh, preparing for the exit exam or for your day-to-day -day clinics. If you see a complex patient, you don't know what to do, you can refer to the book. Or if you're caught, for example, when you're an orthopedic consultant and in the middle of the night, you, you have been asked to do a tailless fracture uh, you can open up the book and read about what to do, how to do, and the book will help. So, so that's the idea uh, uh, that the book, book covers everything what one needs to know. Now, in addition, uh, there will be a companion website with additional resources. Uh, unfortunately, it has been delayed and it won't be available before end of August. But once it's available, it will have uh, MCQs, again, for the exam point of view, uh, lots of talks, 
uh, videos of surgical techniques. And one of my personal favorite is actually um, the presentation by my radiology colleagues, uh, Sango uh, and uh, Raj, uh, where they take you through normal foot and ankle MRI scan and the one with pathologies. And I, I really uh, enjoyed and learned a lot from it. Thank you. And what has been the most rewarding aspect of being involved in editing this book? So, Jill, this has been a journey. Um, so it started about 20 months back when I first thought about it and approached the publishers. And uh, we, we are to this moment now when we are launching this book. But it has been a very rewarding uh, journey. Uh, I've made uh, lots of uh, friends, connections, and I really enjoyed working with this distinguished team of authors who have supported me uh, so much and, and just done a superb job. And when, when the readers read it, then they, they will see the, 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 the quality of the chapters themselves. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to actually thank a lot of people. I can't name everyone, but I'll just try to mention a few people. So first of all, um, the trainees, I thank them for inspiring me to, 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 to you know, in the seek of knowledge and uh, to write the book. So there are lots of trainees uh, who work with me and uh, I'm thankful to them. Uh, my teachers who have taught me, in particular, my mentor, uh, Fred Robinson, who has very kindly uh, agreed to be here on the book launch. And uh, I really appreciate it, uh, especially so when he's actually holidaying but he's going to take time uh, from off his, uh, out of the family time he's having and uh, will we'll, uh, say a few words and launch this book officially later on. Um, the organizations, so BOFAS, um, lots of people have supported me from BOFAS um, in writing as well as in sort of, you know, spreading the work and giving me resources if required. Uh, especially Mark, um, who has very kindly come from all the way from Sheffield to chair it, this book launch meeting. So very uh, thankful to him. Uh, Joe, um, I, I'm, you know, you, you have worked so hard to make this book launch program a success and thanks a lot uh, to you. I don't know without you if this would have been possible. Uh, British Indian Orthopedic Society, uh, executive committee uh, and my friends, uh, especially BJ and uh, Sunil, they have always been so helpful and supportive. And uh, they have given us uh, this uh, Zoom uh, launch uh, where we are launching this uh, uh, event today. Um, my friends from EFAS, uh, Manuel is one of the authors and uh, I would like to thank him. Um, the program today, we have we put together a program and this is being delivered by a galaxy of foot and ankle stars. So super lectures. I'm really looking forward to listen to them. So all of those who are contributing today, uh, Rajesh, uh, Trisha, um, Harry, uh, Dishan, uh, Santal, uh, Venu, uh, Nilesh, uh, Anthony, uh, Dave, uh, and Hero, I hope I haven't missed out anyone. Um, the sponsors, so without your support, um, JAMO, uh, Joints Operations and Nafield, without your support, it would not have been possible to run this event. So thank you very much for that. And last but not the least, uh, I would like to thank my family who has been um, behind me as a rock, uh, especially uh, well, <laughs> there's only one wife, so Sulakshmi, my dear wife, and my adorable kids, uh, Juhi and Yash. Thank you all very much. And I hope uh, the program today goes a success and the readers of this book uh, read it and, and feel exactly the same what I've said. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. And now we hand over to our first author, Rajesh Kakwami. And I shall be talking to you today on surgical management of hallux valgus. What are my options? I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon working in the Northumbria Healthcare NHS Trust in the Northeast of England. I would like to thank Panish Bhatia for this fantastic book and for this opportunity to be able to talk to you. Surgical correction of the hallux valgus 
depends on what is causing the patient's symptoms. The best outcomes are not from brilliant surgery, but by selecting the most appropriate treatment or procedure for your patient. And you should be ready to say no to surgery. For example, if this patient who's 85 years old lady comes to you with a severe hallux valgus, but her main symptoms are the second toe rubbing against the footwear, she may be better served with an amputation of the second toe rather than a reconstructive type of surgery. There are certain patient symptoms which are more amenable to surgical correction, like the pain over the dorsal medial prominence or the bunion, and inability to wear enclosed footwear. Arthritis of the first metatarsophalangeal joint or a dysfunctional first ray causing transfer metatarsalgia. Certain symptoms like a patient demanding cosmetic correction of this hallux valgus should raise alarm bells and this is not a good indication for surgery. If there are concerns regarding disease progression, these are best served with reassurance and they'll be back when the deformity becomes symptomatic. Pathophysiology of the first ray, hallux valgus, involves medial subluxation of the first metatarsal head over the sesamoids with slow erosion of the plantar crista. The EHL, FHL, and the adductor halluses now become deforming forces. The abductor halluses, which is normally a corrective force, becomes dysfunctional and translates plantar to the first metatarsal. The surgical correction of hallux valgus can be broadly categorized into three sections. The first section in patients with hallux valgus with end-stage arthritis of the first metatarsophalangeal joint, i.e. hallux valgus with hallux rigidus. Second category with patients of first tarsometatarsal joint instability. And the third category be, being patients with a stable first TMT joint and a relatively well-preserved first metatarsophalangeal joint. If the patient has a positive grind test, tenderness over the joint line, dorsal osteophytes, end-stage arthritis of the first MTP joint, then they may be best served with a metatarsophalangeal joint fusion, albeit there's a 10% risk of non-unions in these category. Or if it is a very inactive patient, then they may be best served with an excision arthroplasty, i.e. Keller's type of procedure. Patients with first tarsometatarsal hyperlaxity are best served with the first tarsometatarsal joint fusion, i.e. a lapidus type of procedure. In the category of patients with a stable first tarsometatarsal joint and a relatively well-preserved first MTP joint, are best served with a metatarsal osteotomy type of procedure. The type of osteotomy would depend whether this deformity is mild, moderate, or severe. In mild cases, a distal metatarsal osteotomy, like a chevron type of osteotomy, would suffice. In moderate deformities, you generally need a metatarsal shaft type of osteotomy, for example, the scarf osteotomy. In patients with a severe hallux valgus, you may want to do a basal metatarsal osteotomy, which can be a medial opening wedge, a lateral closing wedge, or a dome type of osteotomy. Or you may prefer to do a first TMT joint fusion to correct a severe hallux valgus. The intention of these realignment procedures is to get that first metatarsal head repositioned over the sesamoids to reduce the intermetatarsal angle back to normal, i.e. restore the alignment of the hallux, derotate the hallux if necessary, especially if there's a pronation component to the deformity, to reduce your risk of recurrence. The lateral soft tissue release procedure generally involves release of the metatarsal sesamoid ligament with or without the adductor halluses being released. The distal metatarsal osteotomies generally are chevron types 
which involves stabilization either with wires, screws, or even sutures. The minimally invasive type of procedures of chevronic and osteotomies can be stabilized percutaneously with cannulated, fully threaded cancellous screws. The scarf osteotomies do allow a significant translation of the metatarsal and can be stabilized with headless or headed compression screws. Akin osteotomies may be added if there's hallux valgus interphalanges. So I'll leave you with the aims of surgery, which involves restoring the first metatarsal head over the sesamoid and a congruous first MTP joint. I'm delighted to be asked to give a talk today. I'm going to talk about my tips on the management of the rheumatoid foot. This is obviously not going to be a comprehensive talk about everything to do with the rheumatoid foot, but to focus on a few things that I've learned over the years of treating many patients, not just with rheumatoid, but with all the other inflammatory arthropathies too. We're not going to dwell on pathophysiology, on the entire assessment of a patient or non-operative treatment, as this is not the right forum. So my first tip is to always be aware. I know it may sound daft, but we know from age old literature, borne out by more recent studies, that a huge percentage of rheumatoid patients have foot involvement and indeed present with their feet. And I found that actually it's even more likely uh, for me to diagnose other inflammatory arthropathies. So think seronegative in a patient with multiple enthesopathies or with associated inflammatory sounding low back pain. Remember the connective tissue disorders, Ehlers-Danlos, etc in a patient with multiple joint laxities and other systemic symptoms. My next tip is not to let your hip or knee surgical colleagues tell you to do the foot first because they're concerned that forefoot surgery is dirty and will infect their beautiful shiny new joint replacement. That is complete nonsense, so just persuade your colleagues of this. So moving straight on to the forefoot, what do I do here? Well, for the hallux, first off, if the joint is uh, OK and is preserved in a younger patient, then I will try to realign the joint to preserve movement for as long as possible. Yes, there's a risk of recurrence and progression of arthritis, but as long as you've counseled the patient appropriately, and they understand the possible options in the future if things change, then personally, I think it's preferable in, in that group. Once the joint is destroyed, you've got no real option other than to either excise or fuse it. And it's uh, fusion that is my uh, preference in these patients. For me, fusion gives better and more reliable pain relief. It gives you a better functioning foot as it restores the weight bearing function of the first ray more effectively. And clearly you do not get recurrence. There's certainly a risk of IP joint degenerative change, particularly if you get the position wrong. I know that Stainsby would argue that excision arthroplasty better restores a transverse arch. But the issue for me is the higher, higher recurrence rate with excision arthroplasty. And although the toes may only drift into valgus and not dorsiflexion so that you don't get a recurrence of the plantar colostis, patients want straight toes and to get into relatively normal shoes. So for me, I personally think that a fusion in the degenerate joint is the uh, more appropriate option. So fuse the hallux if you can't realign it. With the lesser toes, again, if it's feasible to preserve the MTP joints, then I will do so. I can't seem to get consistent results with uh, multiple vials and shortening osteotomies. So for me, an MTP joint release and PIP fusion is my preferred option. Once the joints are dislocated or are uh, destroyed by the degenerative process, then normally you have to take out bone because they will be uh, too short. And the choice is then between the metatarsal heads or proximal phalanges. And I favor a Stainsby type excision of the base of the proximal phalanx with rerouting of the extensor down to the flexor tendon. In terms of the forefoot, if you've got more than two toes affected, then you've got to treat all four toes and you've got to do the same thing to all of them. It's no good excising one metatarsal head and another base of proximal phalanx. And also don't leave one uh, unoperated on, even if it is unaffected, because you will be back in the very near future to address that toe because you've changed the entire forefoot balance. Also, I've discovered that in psoriatics, the uh, MTP joints in particular get stiff and I've not found that they do particularly well uh, with realignment surgery. So this is my most common procedure, combination of an MTP fusion and stains before foot arthroplasty. 
But you can see here that the wounds uh, are very, very close together and you can see the tension in them. So you've really got to take uh, very great care with your soft tissues. Place your incisions very carefully so that you've got good and equal skin bridges. I'm slightly obsessive. I like to preserve the longitudinal veins because I do think that it makes a difference to post-operative swelling. I hate scissors. They tear tissues if you use them to spread things. So cut with a sharp knife. Change the blade op often. Close the skin loosely. Put a corner stitch in at the apex and only a couple either side. It may not look beautiful at the beginning uh, and it'll definitely look worse in a few days time. But in the long run, they heal well. Keep your patient in bed for a few days afterwards. I like to keep them elevated for a good 48, 72 hours and leave very clear instructions, both about close neurovascular observations and instructions that if anybody is concerned, take out the wire. Wires aren't vital. Far better to lose a wire than a toe. So despite the incisions looking awful to begin with, years down the line, they fade and they look absolutely fine. So in terms of lesser toes, as I said, if more than two are affected, treat them all. I prefer metatarsal head preservation. I think it gives better results. Have very great respect for the soft tissues and beware the psoriatics, which are stiff. From the point of view of the hind foot, it's relatively straightforward. But again, keep in mind soft tissue integrity, particularly the state of tibialis posterior and the deltoid. And know if they're incompetent before you make your plan. You don't want your hind foot fusion failing into valgus because the deltoid was incompetent and you had not realised. In terms of the joints, if they're involved in symptomatic, then realistically the only choice is to fuse them. There's obviously going to be a debate about the ankle, uh, but here is not the time or place for this. So my final tip, therefore, is the hind foot. Remember soft tissue integrity. So thank you again for asking me to talk and I leave you with my uh, tips for the management of the rheumatoid foot. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm Harry and I'm going to talk to you about the Zadic Oscalsis osteotomy. But before I do that, I'd like to offer my personal congratulations to Manish Bhatia and his team for compiling and publishing this excellent book. When we talk about the Hagland syndrome, the posterior superior calcaneal prominence, the retrocalcaneal bursitis, and insertional Achilles tendinopathy all feature in causing the symptoms that we associate with this condition. It's the second most common cause of heel pain, and apart from the usual conservative methods of treatment of the Achilles tendon, uh, local debridement often becomes necessary, particularly due to the large size of the posterior superior prominence. However, the results of such debridement is variable. We have long recognized that there is a morphological variant of the oscalsis where the calcaneus appears longer than it ought to be, and this may be responsible for some of the symptoms. This was first described by Hagland in 1928. In 1939, uh, Isidore Zadek uh, then published a paper describing an osteotomy for the cure of achillobursitis, as he called the condition, which was modified by Taylor. The aim of the uh, procedure was to shorten the, the dorsal length of the oscalsis by excising a uh, cuneiform dorsal wedge. The apex of this wedge was directed anterior to the plantar tuberosity, which then allows the posterior superior prominence to be tilted anteriorly away from the Achilles tendon. It also rotates the tuberosity, thereby altering the tender Achilles by uh, superiorizing its insertion into the tuberosity. It also achieves uh, a decrease in the calcaneal pitch. More recently, Eve Tony uh, and his team published um, an interesting paper where they describe a new ratio, the ratio of the, uh, the dorsal length uh, Y1 to the longest uh, length of the, uh, the oscalsis and uh, noted that if the ratio fell below 2.5, it strongly correlated with impingement of the Achilles tendon insertion. Therefore, uh, a, a, if you aim to decrease the Y1 distance, this will allow one to elevate the tuberosity, anteriorize the posterior superior prominence, and also decrease the innate tension in the tender Achilles and in particular the gastrocnemius. In a diagrammatic representation, you can see the excision of the, the dorsally based wedge with the apex anterior to the uh, plantar tuberosity. A decrease 
in Y2 will uh, cause an elevation of the posterior aspect of the os calcis, decreasing the tension in the tendo Achilles and anteriorizing the posterior superior prominence. I do this by minimally invasive methods as shown uh, and by plastically deforming the plant cortex, close the wedge dorsally, creating the previously mentioned effects. The resulting incision is often less than a centimeter. There are other variations uh, of the trajectory of this osteotomy. This is one uh, described by Anthony Pereira in his foot and ankle clinics review, where the uh, trajectory is directed at uh, the plantar tuber osteo or even posterior to it, but achieves similar results. I've done about 15 of these procedures over the last few years, uh, and the results have been very encouraging. Uh, almost all patients bar one uh, were successful in resolving their symptoms and uh, complications were few and reversible. The literature certainly is sparse in this condition, but uh, it appears to be gathering momentum as there is now a finite science thanks to Eve Tune. I appreciate the difficulties with the uh, classification of various morphological types based on calcaneal dimensions, uh, but I'm uh, learning uh, more and more as I read up about them. I also often wonder which component of the osteotomy works best, but I suspect it's a combination of all of them. This paper again by Yves Tone and his colleagues, uh, which is currently in press, uh, describes the, the results, a surgical technique in, in about 50 uh, of his patients. And he has now created a simple algorithm based on his calcaneal length ratio, where if the ratio is less than 2.5, it's abnormal, and he would perform a Zadig osteotomy. Uh, and if it's uh, over 2.5, then he would uh, elect to do a calcaneoplasty. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a safe, uh, a procedure in my hands with predictable results and minimal complications. The algorithm has become clearer with the, uh, the newer science that's come forth. Uh, I do prefer a minimally invasive approach for its various advantages. I'm still grappling with what the biomechanical effects on gait and push-off strength are likely to be. In other words, I'm unsure as to how big a wedge I can excise, but I suspect it depends on the original ratio again. The extended indications have not been explored by me in this operation. Once again, I'm very grateful uh, to Manish for having given me the opportunity to partake of this excellent venture uh, and offer my every wish for it to be successful. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Manish, congratulations on uh, your book and thank you for inviting me to talk on uh, uh, inferior heel pain, which is chapter 10 of the book. So I'm briefly going to talk about inferior heel pain and uh, the message of the chapter and of this talk is that not all inferior heel pain is due to plantar fasciitis and plantar fasciitis itself is probably a misnomer because it's not always uh, inflammatory in nature. There are many structures in the inferior heel as well as for the plantar fascia. There are bone lesions, soft, other soft tissue lesions and nerve lesions which can all cause uh, inferior heel pain. The most common probably is a stress fracture and here you'll find tenderness on heel compression and the clue of the patient is that they get pain on activity rather than the typical early morning pain. And the treatment obviously is activity modification uh, and so you must also address the cause such as osteoporosis. As you know, the x-ray may be normal initially but then will show a stress fracture if you do an MRI early, it will show earlier on the MRI. Tumors of bone are rare, but are not to be missed. And the specific features that they get pain that keeps them awake at night. And here is a chondrosarcoma of the heel. Tarsal tunnel syndrome in my practice is most commonly caused by a space occupying lesion. The pain is much more medial 
And in some patients, you might get a canal. And here you'll see the most common cause, which is a ganglion that's trapped in the tarsal tunnel. The nerve to abductor digiti or the abductor digiti quinti is a branch of a lateral plantar nerve that is sensory to bone and motor to abductor digiti quinti. The pain is again more medial, but slightly more inferior than in the tarsal tunnel. There may be a tinnel in some, and uh, what you'll find is that conservative treatment usually works, but in some cases, you may have to decompress the area, focusing on decompressing the whole branch of the uh, inferior plantar nerve. Don't forget that uh, S1 neuropathy in patients with Tartica, and every so often you'll get a patient who has associated neurology, but is presenting with inferior heel pain due to a sciatic lesion. The heel pad underneath uh, the area is specialized because the fat is contained in this fibroelastic tissue in order to provide cushioning. And if you walk a lot on a hard surface or in bad shoes, then you may find that the heel pad gets bruised and it may even atrophy. You lose cushioning. The pain is more central and more proximal nearer the insertion of the Achilles tendon. And the treatment is to provide cushioning insoles. Soft tissue tumors in that area are very rare, but again, not to be missed. Here is a patient who's presenting with an emphysitis at the insertion of the plantar fascia into the calcaneus. This patient, in fact, had Reiter's syndrome and had an associated sausage toe. The clue is associated joint pain, early morning stiffness, and high ESR. And the management, obviously, is medication under the care of a rheumatologist. For future research and for patients in whom the pain is not resolving, you might consider an MRI. And we've shown in a study that if you do an MRI, there is sometimes inflammation, sometimes purely fasciosis, sometimes a partial tear, and sometimes a complete tear. This is a typical patient with an inflammatory plantar fasciitis, and you'll see that there's thickening of the plantar fascia, and there's inflammation in the soft tissues above and below. The pain is typical at the site of insertion of the plantar fascia, and there is early morning pain, and there is uh, uh, swelling in that area. The treatment is an anti-inflammatory, and here you might consider steroid injection above the plantar fascia, not below to cause uh, fat pad atrophy, and the treatment is cushioning, stretching, etc. On the other hand, here is a patient with a bone marrow edema in the area which is causing pain. Here, sometimes the patient gets more night pain. There's a suggestion that uh, shockwave therapy may be more useful in patients in whom there is uh, calcaneal edema. The plantar fascia-related pain may be due to a simple fasciosis where there is only thickening of a plantar fascia and there is very little inflammation. And here, there is no role for steroid injections, particularly as you may cause a rupture uh, when there is a partial tear. The focus is on stretching, uh, cushioning, etc. And here is a patient with an acute rupture. The onset of pain was sudden, and the treatment is to treat uh, the patient in a splint for six weeks in order to allow the plantar fascia to heal. So the message of this brief talk is that not all inferior heel pain is due to plantar fasciitis. Consider the other lesions by looking at features in the history and the sites of tenderness. Thank you very much. 
And in these days of COVID, we should remember that there are many uses for a mask. We can use it to protect others. We can use it as a blindfold. We can use a mask as a chin guard, or we can use a mask as a fashion accessory. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Manesh, I'd like to thank you for kindly inviting me to write the chapter on Caver's foot. I find Caver's foot surgery fascinating, and particularly Caver's feet uh, with an underlying neurological condition, because every patient's management has to be chosen carefully in a very similar way to how we choose a meal carefully in an a la carte restaurant. So I'd like to talk through chapter nine as if uh, we were choosing a selection from an a la carte restaurant. Most of all, and maybe very importantly at the beginning, you need to know what type of restaurant you're going to. An accurate diagnosis and understanding will suggest the future and prognosis of your meal and your surgical management. You need to know whether the uh, patient is likely to be in a wheelchair at a young age, or are they likely to lead a full and active life, and indeed perhaps uh, have uh, children with the same underlying condition and cavus feet. To achieve an accurate diagnosis, it's important to take a family history, a thorough spinal and neurological examination, and to look at subtle neurological signs like poor balance or uh, for subtle upper limb signs, and to work very closely with your neurologist. A cavus foot can due, be due to a muscle imbalance from a uh, cause anywhere along the neurological axis from the motor cortex down to the muscles themselves. Then, are you ready to dine? Have you done everything else that you need to do? Have you completed your work jobs? Have you been to the gym? Have you bought the flowers? And that's the same. Have you ensured all the non-operative treatments have been tried? Have you tried bracing? Have you tried accommodative uh, insoles? Have you adjusted footwear? And then you're ready to start. So the first uh, course, the first thing to consider is uh, the tightness of the gastrocnemius and to consider whether um, the deformity has been affected by this. And the key test is, of course, the silver skull test, which will determine whether the tightness is in the gastrocnemius uh, proximally or is it in the gastrocnemius and soleus. If it's just proximal, then we would tend to do a PMGR or a strayer release. Whereas if it's uh, more distal, then you'll need to release the, the Achilles itself with a hook type lengthening, or perhaps even a formal open incision and posterior release. Then we move on to the super course. And I uh, use the analogy of the forefoot and the procedures we could do in the forefoot, because quite often the soup course might be the first procedure, maybe it's sufficient for the whole meal. And um, quite often the forefoot may be the presenting complaint and uh, patients who may have their forefoot surgery sorted and be able to cope for a number of years without needing anything additional. If there's clawing of the hallux, a Jones procedure is sufficient, or to deal with the clawing of the lesser toes, you may need to fuse the PIP joints or perhaps a Hibbs tino suspension. We move on to the uh, hind foot and consider the uh, operations we can do in the hind foot. So the uh, most important thing is to see whether the hind foot is correctable. And this is our old friend, the Coleman block test. And uh, this will see whether you need to perform hind foot surgery. And the commonest uh, procedure that is done is a calcaneal osteotomy. Indeed, a very useful survey was uh, conducted the International National History Study by Dishan Singh and published uh, two years ago, showed that 93% of uh, cases would involve a calcaneal osteotomy. And you can do this through an open technique, the extended lateral on the left, or as I prefer, through a little MIS approach on the right hand side. Other procedures you can do in the hind foot can involve a brostrum ligament repair if uh, the lateral ligaments have been stretched out beyond their functional limits. Or if the hind foot is degenerate, then you may need to consider correcting the, the varus deformity with a subtalar fusion or triple fusion. The main course, the main crucial key part is dealing with the midfoot arch and the supination and the actual cavus deformity itself. And this can be addressed in a number of ways. The uh, majority of uh, cavus feet that we see, particularly in shark and Mary tooth, are forefoot driven by an over plantar flex first ray. And therefore, this is corrected by a dorsiflexion first metatarsal osteotomy. And again, referring back to the International National History Study, 78% of cases involved a first metatarsal osteotomy. 
The midfoot can also be addressed if it's degenerate with uh, perhaps uh, later in life a first TMT fusion, which can build in some correction in a similar way to elevate the first ray. Or if it's very severe and very stiff, you may need to, to take a wedge resection of the entire midfoot to correct the arch, which is rarely done, but it can be done as, as a reserve for the most severe deformities. Now, the dessert is definitely, in my opinion, the most important course. And this is when you have to balance the muscles. In um, the cause of the cavus foot, it can be that a normal muscle is overpowering a weak antagonist muscle, or it can be a spastic muscle is overpowering a normal strength muscle. And there are some uh, familiar patterns with the underlying conditions. This is where it comes back to the point about knowing what the underlying condition is. But in charcot marie tooth the, a very common combination is peroneus brevis is weak and tip post is strong, or the tip ant is weak and peroneus longus is strong. And this table is taken from uh, chapter nine. And to address this, then we have a, a number of uh, clever operations, which I enjoy doing, which for example, this is taking tip post uh, through the, around the pine, the tibia, and then through the interosseous membrane. Now, finally, the, we get to the cheese course and to consider the soft tissues. If they're old scars, you may want to consider doing this by MIS. And it's very important that you don't stretch the skin in a severe deformity any further, and therefore to plan an operation that shortens the long side. And a useful tip for this is if you are doing a, a bony cut, if you, rather than taking a wedge to correct the deformity, if you take a trapezoid, that'll actually shorten the bone structure, decrease the tension of skin, soft tissues, and release the, release the tightness of the plantar fascia and lower the arch. And finally, the long course that goes on for a long time, the coffee, the chocolates and port. Well, the long-term follow-up is very important. The muscle balance may evolve with time, so it's likely to need further surgery. And I advise you to work very closely with your local neurologist. I'm very fortunate in my institution to have the Neuromuscular Centre, an excellent neurologist to work with in the long-term follow-up. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, tongue-in-cheek comparison to the a la carte menu, but actually I think it's very important to stress the different key areas in the decision-making which you individualise for each patient with a cavus foot deformity. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, may I start congratulating Manish and his team for producing such an excellent work um, uh, with the book. And can I also um, start thanking uh, Manish for giving us an opportunity to write a chapter on ankle arthritis. As you're all familiar, uh, ankle arthritis is um, not the most common form of arthritis in the lower limb joints. Um, and of course, the hip and knee is much more common and is related to uh, aging uh, process. We know that the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis and the inflammatory arthropathy uh, is progressively uh, falling over the years. Uh, and post-traumatic arthritis is, of course, is the most common indication for um, treatment of end-stage ankle arthritis. The figures from Scottish Arthroplasty uh, Project uh, showed that the reason for doing ankle replacement, for example, um, is now uh, due to trauma um, rather than inflammatory arthritis as it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. Of course, when we start treating um, ankle arthritis, uh, there are non-operative methods, of course, um, start with physiotherapy, podiatry assessment, and um, orthotic support for the uh, arthritic ankle, AFO type device. All of them are uh, quite effective. Um, intraarticular injections are becoming more popular now for a number of joints, including ankle joint. Hyaluronic acid has been um, used more recently, um, but again, there is no strong evidence to support the use of this. Um, in the ankle and other joints. And as you can see from the study quoted, uh, it's no more effective than a, a normal saline. Operative treatment uh, has a number of uh, options. Um, if there is an osteophyte, which is causing problem in a localized area, for example, anterior impingement uh, type issue, then one can do uh, orthoscopic debrima or even open debrima to relieve the uh, pressure. Um, and there are other um, options like the uh, osteotomy, distal tibial osteotomy, 
uh, or distraction uh, using an Elizarov type frame um, to uh, relieve the symptoms, particularly in a patient, slightly younger patient, uh, who can't quite decide uh, whether to have an ankle fusion or a replacement. But by and large, majority of the patients heading, uh, they are heading towards either an ankle fusion uh, or a replacement ultimately. Ankle fusion has been around for a long time. It's a, a very tried and tested method of uh, treating ankle arthritis. It uh, results in a stable limb, uh, particularly for a, a, a younger person in a manual type labor. Um, but it may not be suitable for all the patients. Um, and also the recovery uh, perhaps is in the healing process is a bit prolonged and it may not be suitable again for that reason in, in some patients in my view. But it's still referred to as a gold standard um, when it comes to the surgery for an arthritic ankle. Um, we know that more recently, uh, arthroscopic um, fusion has, has gained popularity and it certainly is the most common way of fusing an ankle uh, these days. Um, and the studies have shown um, a good success rate, uh, you know, um, easier uh, recovery uh, following this operation in a number of patients. But there is a requirement for an alternative in some patients, particularly patients who had associated arthritis in the other lower limb joints, uh, hind foot joints, and also in the uh, knee joint. Um, and uh, there are more recently, certainly, uh, uh, there's a lot more awareness amongst uh, patients, uh, and they would like to preserve uh, movement in their joints. And I think ankle fusion is being generally seen. Um, they just they, they, they find it difficult to understand what an ankle fusion is about or what the function will be like and so on. So for that reason, some patients uh, choose to have uh, ankle replacement and come asking you. Um, my own choice of patients, particularly when I started doing ankle replacement, uh, is the kind of older patients, similar to what we did with the knee and hip replacements um, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, elderly patients who just retired and so on, the functional demand is not that great. And of course, bilateral ankle arthritis, at least one side should be replaced and there are good studies to show that that is the case. Um, when you start doing it, I think probably choose uh, moderate levels of deformity um, and then you can take on uh, more severe cases once you've gone through the learning curve. Uh, so my ideal patient would be an elderly patient with bilateral hind foot arthritis. Well, this debate about fusion or a replacement, I think this is still going on and I suspect it will go on. Um, but I don't really see a competition between the two operations. I think in, in, in selected patients, I think fusion is a better option. In, in some patients, replacement is a better option. Um, our own TARWA trial done in the UK will be uh, reporting uh, at some point. Um, and I'll be interested to um, see what the conclusion would be. But I think many of us who have been doing ankle fusion and replacement for a long time, we have indications and I don't think our practice is going to change. But nevertheless, I think it would be useful to have more published evidence to support these operations But both of them. So in summary, I think post-traumatic arthritis should by and large, we should try hard to avoid it. Um, either of the options, fusion or replacement, is not perfect. It has its own disadvantages and so on. Uh, ankle fusion is certainly most suitable for most patients, but there is no doubt ankle replacement has a place, uh, in my view, for a select uh, group of patients. Um, and the indications appear to be increasing uh, all the time. So thank you very much once again for the opportunity, Manish, and uh, I hope the evening goes well. And um, best wishes and good luck uh, to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greetings. This talk will, will cover the management of acute Charcot neuroarthropathy. Charcot neuroarthropathy is one of the most devastating complications of diabetes or, in fact, any peripheral neuropathy uh, generating pathology. It is known to decrease the life expectancy of the individual by about 14 years. Uh, it also carries a very high risk of a lower extremity amputation uh, following the diagnosis. So, early diagnosis is really critical for better prognosis. So the patients typically present with a history of sudden, unexplained, painless, red, warm, and swollen foot with no specific history of significant trauma. They may, they may be minor twisting injury, but not significant enough to cause such uh, clinical signs. The clinical signs are usually 
you know, a warm and swollen red foot and ankle with deformity in late presentations. There can also be crepitus on palpation. In severe presentations, it can be like bag of bones. So it is critical that we quantify the degree of temperature difference. The best way to achieve that is by using the uh, you know, digital thermometers and compare with the opposite normal foot. The investigations, you know, the diagnosis is mainly clinical, but you know, blood investigations can help to differentiate an infection episode, which is very uncommon. C-reactive protein can be very high in an infection episode. It tends to be slightly higher in acute shock uh, When it comes to imaging, if you are concerned about any collection from infection, ultrasound guided aspiration can be helpful, but by and large, uh, plain radiographs help us to identify the staging of the disease, whether it is to the fragmentation phase stage uh, or stage two of coalescence or later as consolidation. But MRI imaging is very helpful to diagnose the pre-radiographic stage, which is very critical. The X-rays look normal, but the clinical presentation and that uh, usually shows uh, raised, uh, well, the, these typical changes in MRI imaging. In this particular example, the plain foot radiograph was normal, or in this example, there is a stress uh, fracture type uh, change in the calcaneum, and this one shows clearly the dislocation. So, but the MRI shows typical uh, clinical radiological presentations, uh, findings. CT spect can also be used, uh, and you know, it is equally diagnostic as uh, MRI, it is the surgeon's preference in general. By and large, once you make a diagnosis of an acute shock or neuroarthropathy, the treatment is total contact casting uh, and offloading, means non-weight bearing, leg elevation, and total contact cast application. Uh, you know, there are ways of uh, remaining ambulatory status while maintaining non-weight bearing status in that foot. But sometimes in very early presentations, one can use a, a, a bivalve total contact cast or even total contact cast that allows weight bearing in early presentations. And there are also commercially available removable braces that can be used or a crow walker. By and large, once you achieve immediate offloading and with continued offloading, it, it results in consolidation in most uh, presentations and surgical shoes allow um, offloading of those bone prominences of deformity. But if there is a large bone prominence, particularly on the plantar side, one can ex one can do exostectomy. But if there is a larger deformity, global deformity, that quite often requires a reconstruction. But in a small portion of these presentations, despite immediate and adequate offloading, the instability continues and the deformity progresses. In such situations, the foot will become at risk and may benefit from surgical intervention, such as this example in a 62-year-old patient with midfoot sharp coat, and you can clearly see that the medial cuneiform has extruded through, causing ulceration and infection, and such presentation requires immediate surgical debridement, and once the infection control is achieved, uh, one can uh, do a recontraction of, of the sharp coat affected area. And because this procedure is done during the active inflammatory, inflammatory phase because of the swelling, you know, the wounds uh, may need to be left open. That's not an issue here. With vac dressing and appropriate measures, one can achieve skin cover. Another example of hind foot acute shark coat with severe deformity, uh, again, using the same principles of long segment rigid uh, fixation, with optimal bone opposition, one can achieve uh, bone fusion uh, in corrected position. So just to summarize, painless, swollen, and warm red foot um, and red foot and ankle with minimal or uh, uh, no history of trauma in the presence of neuropathy is an acute shock or neuroarthropathy unless proved otherwise. Immediate offloading and multidisciplinary care delivery is critical. But if the foot is at risk due to the progressive deformity or stability, surgery, using the principles I enumerated earlier uh, is mandatory. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi Manish, uh, thank you for inviting me to this inaugural launch of Essentials of Foot and Ankle Surgery. It's been both a pleasure and a learning experience to be part of this project and hopefully uh, to all the readers who buy this book. 
Um, my topic is subtle list rank injuries and bridging plates. I'll focus more on the subtle injuries. So there isn't a clear definition of what a subtle list rank injury is. Um, this is the best definition I could find by crates at all, that these are injuries to the medial metatarsal tarsal complex with weight bearing diastasis of not greater than two millimeters between the first and second metatarsal base compared with weight bearing views of the contralateral and injured side. So what is the history symptoms and signs? Um, well, these are low energy injuries uh, falling from a short step, a ladder with axial loading during sports. Often the patient says they felt a pop in the foot and a complaint of pain in the midfoot area. The signs, well, there may be obvious midfoot pain. Um, if you squeeze between the first and second metatarsal space, they say, oh yeah, the, the, the uh, midfoot does hurt. If they go on tiptoes, it's painful. And some may have a positive dorsal draw test, a bit like the Lachman test. Um, you may feel a clunk when you do this, but if you get more than three and a half millimeters displacement, uh, then that's uh, going to be suspicious. Um, if you apply pronation to the midfoot, they may complain of pain. And some of you may have heard of the piano key stress test, where if you grab the first, second metatarsal and plantar flexion dorsiflexor, they complain of pain in the midfoot. You can also rotate axially. What are the radiological uh, features of these? Well, in some patients, you may see what we call the notch sign. So if you damage the dorsal ligament complex, you may get a pronation rotation of the medial cuneiform. In others, you may just see widening of the first, second interspace, but not more than three millimeters. If you're lucky enough to have weight-bearing CT scans, then this um, paper published last year looks at the asymmetrical lambda sign. So Charles Saltzman's group did this. If you take axial slices at the level of the first metatarsal and reference that across the foot, then in a normal foot, you'll see a normal lambda sign. But in a subtle injury, you'll see the lambda sign is asymmetrical. There are a number of classifications, um, but the most commonest one is Nunley and Vertello, where stage one is purely a sprain. Stage two, the ligament, list rank ligament has been damaged, but there's no loss of arch height. And stage three, where you get uh, damage to the ligament, diastasis up to five millimeters, which is then obvious, and uh, loss of the arch height. Um, myosin has tried to modify it uh, as uh, myosin does, but there's also this classification by crates again, where type 1, there's no widening, no rotation. In type 2, uh, there's slight widening up to 2 millimeters, but no rotation. Type 3 is where you see the notch sign, but no widening. Uh, type 4 is where you get both widening and rotation. And type 5, which is the obvious subluxation with second T and T joint. So the message of this uh, short uh, talk is to be suspicious of subtle injuries. They, they're the ones which you often miss. The frank dislocations are easy to diagnose, uh, difficult to manage, but still easy to diagnose. Uh, principle is anatomical reduction, where subtle injuries, if you're not sure, then you need to get standing uh, comparative weight-bearing x-rays. You may even ask for uh, detailed imaging like CT or MRI. And EUA stress views may be of benefit. If that shows you've got an obviously unstable injury, then you need to fix. But if it's subtle, you can treat them in a plaster cast or a moon boot, but watch them closely for the next four to six weeks with interval x-rays to make sure there's no redisplacement. So just a little bit on uh, bridging plates. Um, uh, Hugh uh, compared using bridging plates versus transarticular screws and found that anatomy was better restored with a plate and less joint changes were seen uh, compared to transarticular screws. And Lau uh, looked at 50 patients, found there's no difference in terms of outcomes. It has to be said that plates uh, require more dissection uh, and may require removal. On the other side, transarticular screws can break. So thank you very much, uh, Manish, for giving me this opportunity. Chapter 14, acute Achilles tendon ruptures are and will continue to be a matter of controversy 
among orthopedic surgeons. If we have a look at, at the literature, there's so many papers telling us what to do initially, how to follow up a rupture, and they give us a big variety of different results. So this might end up in confusing the orthop orthopedic surgeons into what to do initially and what to do next. So this chapter 14 will try to guide the reader through decision making in acute Achilles tendon ruptures, knowing about what to do, how to do it, complications, how to avoid them. If we have a look at the 1960s, open surgeries led to a high number of skin problems, something which turned to orthopedic treatment in the 1970s to avoid those skin complications, but at the cost of having more re-ruptures. So it was at the end of the 1980s, early 90s, that MIS percutaneous surgery seemed to be the big impact uh, for reducing both re-ruptures and um, skin problems when dealing with an acute Achilles tendon rupture. But at the price of having more sural nerve injuries. At the beginning of this century, orthopedic treatment uh, was possibly the trend because of the development of orthopedic boots, heel wedges, and knowing that protocols with functional rehab after the rupture uh, gave good results, at least uh, as good as those with surgical treatments. So, apparently, regardless of the initial approach, we all agreed that early protective weight bearing and more early mobilization under the supervision of an orthopedic surgeon and or a physiotherapist will possibly be the best uh, to combine uh, with any type of initial treatment that we choose. When it comes to surgery, uh, there's apparently no differences in terms of re ruptures, tissue adhesion, or deep infections when we compare an open versus a mean invasive approach. And surgery was apparently reducing and associated to, with a reduced rate of re ruptures when compared with a non op treatment. But as I told you, non op treatment followed by a functional uh, rigid. Um, it actually gave almost the same results as uh, open surgery or MIS surgery. Something which is a bit of my concern is how about the patient? Most studies do not tell us about the type of patient, so uh, we all agree that we might not indicate the same initial treatment in an 80-year-old lady uh, than in a 20-year-old pro athlete. So apparently in non-physically active patients, non-operative treatments do well, uh, with less chances of getting complications other than re -ruptures. But in physically active patients, obviously in athletes, um, surgery is associated to less re and less chance of having tendon elongation. How about patient compliance? This is again a concern to me. Some of the athletes are not that compliant. So what I don't want to have is an elongation and loss of calf power in an athlete. Uh, I may deal with a re-rupture, uh, but it is very difficult to deal with uh, an elongation of the tendon, less of elasticity and calf power. If you have a look at table 14.3, you will find a highlighted uh, the difficult period between the 8th and the 12th weeks in which we have to supervise uh, the patient not to have uh, too much um, too much stretching on the tendon and being prone to have an elongation of loss of calf power. Finally, we have a look at the outcome. This is a very serious injury for most, um, especially the athletes. 40% of them will not come back to pre-injury levels. And those who, who will come back to previous performance it will take them around two years to come back to those pre-injury levels. So definitely an acute Achilles tendon rupture is a potentially end-of-career injury 
for any pro athlete. Uh, take home messages for this chapter would be that Achilles tendon rupture incidence has increased significantly in the last few decades, uh, mainly in relationship with sports. Diagnosis is still clinical. No not management with functional early movement and weight varying is suitable for most patients. But in those who have special requirements, pro athletes, amateur athletes, in which elongation is an issue and re rupture is an issue, surgical treatment will possibly provide equally good results. Thank you very much. So, um, syndesmotic injuries are common uh, and injury to the syndesmosis can adversely impact to the otero contact mechanics and pressure distribution. Also, missed or inappropriately treated injuries can result in arthritis of the ankle joint due to chronic syndesmotic instability. Therefore, any surgical intervention must allow the syndesmosis to heal at the right length and tension. So, in the context of an ankle fracture, what do we need to know about the syndesmotic injury? Well, firstly, whether it is stable or not. In other words, make a diagnosis. Secondly, is it, do we have to do direct or indirect stabilization if it is unstable? And if direct, we need to ensure accurate reduction. And once we've reduced it, we need to decide whether we use a flexible or rigid implant. What else do we need to know? Well, they are more common in Weber C injuries, but they're pretty common in Weber B injuries as well. And it is often a missed injury. So preoperatively, unless the syndesmotic injury is really obvious on preoperative radiographs, a high index of suspicion is required. Radiographs are poorly predictive of syndesmotic injury. If you take the tibia fibula overlap, traditionally we felt that less than one millimeter on a mortis view equals syndesmotic injury. But we now know that 5% of normal ankles have no overlap at all, and 8% have less than one millimeter overlap. Therefore, the lack of overlap does not define a syndesmotic injury unless the TFO is at least 50% less than for the uninjured ankle. What about the, the tibia fibula clear space? Well, it's probable that it's more useful but only when compared to the opposite side and when there's a difference of more than two, millimeter, two millimeters between the two sides. So preoperatively, absolute radiographic values are not reliable. We always need to get a comparison mortis view of the uninjured ankle. What about preoperative CT? Again, absolute CT value is also not reliable. Therefore, we advocate side-to-side -side comparative CT slices, but most CTs are non-weight bearing, aren't they? Is that important? Well, yes, it is, because there appear to be significant differences in syndesmotic morphology when the CT of the ankle is done supine versus standing. So the future weight-bearing CT, it's here, but it's not widely used, but it's certainly the future. Remember, too, that the CT scan can often change the ankle fracture management plan. So CT is key, as is intraoperative assessment. It is really important to stress every ankle, and not just in the coronal plane, but in the sagittal plane. And you also need to meet, make a radiological assessment of vertical plane stability in terms of the comminution of the fibula fracture. So if syndesmotic incompetence is present, do we perform direct fixation of all syndesmotic injury? Well, that depends. If it's an isolated syndesmotic injury without bone injury, then yes. But if malleolar fractures are present, then no. Why? Well, firstly, because we're very bad at reducing the syndesmosis accurately. And there's lots of uh, proof and literature for that to show that. And secondly, because we might not have to, because we know that fixing the posterior malleolus affords more stability to the syndesmosis than direct syndesmotic stabilization, and that small posterior malleolus fractures lead to worse syndesmotic disruption, so they are also worth stabilizing for the most part. So for the prevention of malreduction, get the fibula fracture out to the correct length of rotation, and then fix any anterior or posterior malleolus fracture that extends into the incisura. And you do, we fix the small fragments for uh, syndesmotic stability and the big fragments in order to restore platform to anatomy as well. And then once fixed, test again. In most cases, the syndesmosis will be stable and indirect stabilization may well be enough, thereby preventing the need for trans-syndesmotic stabilization. But if still not stable, and we have to perform direct transsynesmotic stabilization, how do we do it better? Because whether we use screws or suture buttons, it's the quality of the reduction that is most important. 
And there's a variety of ways to do this. Uh, personally, I use a combination of techniques, including lining up the posterior margin of the fibula with exact, in, in exactly the same way as with the uninjured side uh, relative to the posterior malleolus. Then I also open the syndesmosis for direct visualization, and I ensure the medial tine of my clamp is on the anterior half of the medial malleolus. And, th and then I ensure not to over squeeze. And further, the position of the screw should be no more, or the, or the suture, but no more than two to three centimeters above the joint line. Otherwise, you hit the apex of the tibia and risk it going backwards or forwards in front or behind of the tibia, ending up like this. Once the synosmosis is reduced, you need to decide whether you use a flexible or rigid implant. There are theoretical advantages for a, su for a suture button, but recent literature, although advocating for the suture button, have, their conclusions are pretty debatable. When you really look into it, there are no, really dif no real differences in clinical or functional outcomes. There are minimal differences in radiological outcome, and the only real difference being reoperation rate for screw removal. And the literature shows that we don't need to remove those. So some theoretical advantages for the super suture button, but no level one evidence, and all studies have focused on rotational and coronal translation. It appears that a single suture button does control residual coronal plane instability, but for vertical plane instability, suture buttons offer no stability at all, and you can imagine why. What about sagittal plane stability? Given that this particular um, uh, uh, paper showed that the fibula is most unstable in the sagittal plane after sectioning the syndesmosis. Well, why is that important? Because another group showed that a single suture button is not strong enough to control sagittal plane motion, but it's okay for the coronal uh, plane. And there is some evidence that two suture buttons in divergent fashion can control sagittal plane motion, but certainly not in the vertical plane. You need to also consider the suture buttons are more expensive, with potentially no difference in functional outcome. So concluding, for suspected syndromatic injury, it's not about suture button versus a screw, because there's no level, of, level one evidence to support one over the other. You need to understand that it's a common injury, that accurate diagnosis is important. We're not good at diagnosing it, Pre-op radiographic criteria are unreliable. We need to use comparison radiographs or CTs because absolute values are not helpful. We need to stress every ankle intraoperatively, fix all the bony fragments first and then stress again, and stress in both coronal and sagittal planes, understand that we're not good at accurate transatlantic stabilization, and that accurate reduction is a key, and, they might, and that we might need to use a combination of techniques to get accurate reduction. So screw versus suture button is not a binary choice. It's much more nuanced. And that implant selection between the two should depend on the residual plane of fibula instability. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Mardevan from Reading, Berkshire, and I'll be discussing my chapter on calcaneal fractures and the controversies around them. So, the current situation on the management of these uh, fractures remain uncertain. Some surgeons are enthusiastic about surgery and would recommend them. Others would consider surgery to be complex, expensive, risky, and with uncertain benefits. The decision-making for definitive treatment is multifactorial and should include patient and fracture characteristics, the expertise of the surgeon, and the scientific evidence that should be considered in choosing the best treatment option. So what is the evidence? Sanders in 1993 showed that type two and type three fractures generally did well following operative treatment, but type four fractures had poor outcomes. Buckley in 2002 showed that the functional results were equivalent in the two groups, but there were better outcomes in patients who were not receiving workers' compensation, female or younger. Agron, in his randomized controlled trial, found that operatively treated patients had a reduced prevalence of post-traumatic arthritis, uh, but had a higher risk of complications. In the UK HEAL trial, they found no symptomatic or functional advantage following surgical treatment at two years, but the complications were higher. However, it is worth noting that 
um, patients with gross deformity of the hind foot were excluded from the study. Most of these studies have weaknesses in design, power, and control of bias to answer the question as to which patients may benefit from surgery. So how do we assess a calcaneal fracture and the suitability for treatment? Calcaneal fractures, as we know, are high energy uh, fractures, and these patients should be managed as per ATLS protocol. And one should be vigilant in excluding other concomitant injuries. We should look at patient factors, such as any history of peripheral vascular disease, previous hind foot infection or smoking. And there is evidence that patients with more than one risk factor have an increased risk of wound problems postoperatively. Look at the soft tissues because the soft tissues dictate the outcomes and we have to allow for the soft tissues to improve prior to even considering surgery. Use imaging to help the decision-making process X-rays and CT scans would definitely help characterize the fractures better. So when is it not right to fix? Extra-articular calcaneal fractures with minimal displacement will do well without surgery. Intra-articular calcaneal fractures with minimal displacement will also do well without surgery. And perhaps displaced fractures in the presence of more than one risk factor, such as poor soft tissues, peripheral vascular disease, and smokers, should also be managed non-operatively. Which are the factors that should be fixed? Patients who have gross displace, displacement of the fracture, those with subfibular impingement because of the lateral wall blowout, patients who have joint subluxation or dislocation. And the purpose of operative intervention is to restore the heel shape, relocate the joint, and restore the articular surfaces if possible. All these patients have to be considered for further surgery in the future. So what are the options for surgery or the approaches? The extended lateral approach is probably the workhorse approach for most calcaneal fractures that are complex. It gives you good exposure, but be aware of the soft tissue uh, compromise. The extended sinus tarsi approach are very good at visualizing the actual joint depression, gives you good exposure to the joints, but limited exposure to the tuberosity fragments. And then you can use a combination of percutaneous or MIS, or arth arthroscopic-assisted surgery, uh, which respects the soft tissue, but the exposure and potential correction may be limited, especially for older fractures. So, in conclusion, there is no evidence that operative treatment is suitable for all fracture types. Fracture severity should be used to direct treatment. Undisplaced fractures should be treated non-operatively. Displaced type two and three fractures with intact soft tissue envelopes and no gross displacement or fibular impingement could be managed non-operatively, especially when surgeons are unfamiliar or unpracticed in open reduction internal fixation. Highly commuted fractures have poor results from either operative or non-operative treatment and perhaps consideration of primary reconstruction through arthrodesis should be considered. Enjoy the book. Thank you. Hi, this is Hero. Thank you for purchasing the book, and I really hope you'll enjoy reading it. In this talk, I'm going to reveal some interesting facts about Taylor's fractures that you may not have known to be true. So, let's have a look. Fair Dunn, 1916, saw the bloodiest and longest battle in the history of modern warfare. On the 21st of February 1916, in the torrential rain, 808 German artillery positions opened fire, signalling the beginning of a battle that would take the lives of 800,000 soldiers. In an area of just eight square miles, 2.5 million soldiers from the German Empire and French Republic fought a war of attrition over 300 days. 
By the end, on the 18th of December 1916, 40 million artillery shells had been fired. The casualties from Verdun and the impact it had on the French army was the primary reason for the British starting the Battle of the Somme in July of 1916. High above the battlefield, a new form of warfare had started. In Britain, the Royal Flying Corps, with their 421 aircraft, supported the ground troops during the Battle of the Somme. Life expectancy in the air was no better than on the ground. Pilots on their first sortie did so knowing their nickname, the 20 Minuters, as the average life expectancy of a new pilot was 20 minutes in the air. Even if they survived to fly again, they were unlikely to survive longer than four weeks. Henry Graham Anderson joined the Royal Navy at the outbreak of the war in 1914 and was appointed a surgeon to the Royal Flying School in 1917. In 1919, he published his account of aviation injuries sustained by pilots during the war and reported on 15 cases of fractures of the talus, coining the term aviators astragalus, which many of us know today. Interestingly, two thirds of his cases were on the right hand side, despite the fact that rudder controls are performed with both feet. Was this merely a coincidence or was there more to it? We all know that the commonest mechanism for fracture of the tailors today is due to road traffic accidents. Could there be a similar pattern of injury today as seen by Anderson in 1919? In fact, of the last 100 articles published in the scientific literature on fractures of the talus, only one article analysed whether the left or right side had been injured. Harborview Medical Centre, a level one trauma centre in Seattle, reviewed their series of 132 Taylor neck fractures in 2013 and found that indeed two thirds of all cases were on the right hand side. I want you to imagine a coin on the floor directly in front of you. Step on it. Which foot did you use? If you said the right foot, then you would be in the majority. 84% of people are both right-footed and right-handed. In fact, there has never been any report of a human population in which left-handed individuals predominate. Whilst laterality or preference of a side is well reported in animals, humans are unique in being predominantly right-handed. Chimpanzees do not demonstrate any laterality whilst on all fours. However, during bipedal gait, they demonstrate a preference, but the distribution is even between left and right sides. It's not entirely clear why the human tendency for right-handedness has come about. The Homo locans theory postulates that this is down to the development of language, which is processed in the left cerebral hemisphere. What is clear is that the right arm and leg is stronger in the majority of the population and in response to potential injury, the right leg is likely to bear the force of an injury. So the question arises, if the right leg is stronger, does it equate to differences in the size, shape or strength of the bones? Together with 95% of all known species of life, human beings demonstrate bilateral symmetry. In other words, if we were to draw a bisecting line through our body, the one side should match the other. Studies looking at symmetry of the talus are sparse. However, a large study of 92 tali pairs performed in 2018 found that the right talus was longer, higher, but narrower as compared to the left. So maybe the right talus is generally bigger in most people. A more recent study in 2020, looking at the volume and articular surface differences, found no difference between the two. The conclusion being that any differences were not clinically relevant in terms of implant design. Symmetry has been associated with beauty and harmony in nature. Does this mean that our tali are the ugly ducklings of all the human bones? What if I told you that true beauty lies in mathematics? The golden ratio or phi is a profound mathematical truth that's seen throughout the universe from the spiral of the DNA, the arrangement of petals in a flower, the way a tree grows, the spiral of the nautilus's shell, the shape of a dolphin's body, the arrangement of the orbits of the planets in the solar system, to the spiral of the Milky Way galaxy itself. It defines the proportions of the human body as illustrated by Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. And yes, it's prevalent in the proportions of the human foot in a study I conducted in 2013. The mathematical model of phi was discovered by Fibonacci 
whose numeric sequence can be geometrically illustrated in the phi curve. So does the talus fit the golden ratio? Yes, it does. So maybe it's not an ugly duckling after all. On that um, amazing last sentence, um, that concludes all of the talks this afternoon, um, and I'm hoping you found them all very enjoyable and informative, uh, as I have. Um, we're going to open the floor, both on Zoom and in the auditorium here, to discussion and questions. Um, and to that end, I'd like the uh, presenters who um, are in the room who also gave their talks to come and join me on the podium, if that's all right. Um, and then we'll start the questions and answer uh, process. So we're going to um, place a microphone down here um, so that participants from the floor can come and ask their questions. So any questions at all from the floor? Okay, well, I'll kick everything off. Um, and uh, I'll start with Rajesh, who's here on the podium right next to me. I want to ask you, um, how do you deal with the patient that does turn up with hallux valgus uh, and they are worried about the cosmesis as their primary concern? How do you deal with that situation? Because it's not uncommon in clinic. A very good question and a very tough situation. Uh, now, fortunately for the NHS, they don't treat you because the GPs have got so many hurdles to cross for those patients that fortunately none of them reach your consultant level in NHS practice. Uh, they have to go through podiatry and most of them uh, succumb to it. Now, once the one in private practice is the one which is challenging. Now, it's generally not only cosmesis. If it's pain and if there is a genuine reason for their pain, then you can correct the mechanics of the hallux by surgery. But isolated cosmesis, I have to put my foot down and say no. How do you say no? I just offer them a colleague to go to. Okay. <laughs> uh, without being of secrets, it is a difficult one. Um, and I have to say the way I justify it is to say that um, actually if, if you have a pain-free foot and you're worried about the cosmesis of it and I make it look better but it becomes painful, then you'll never thank me for the operation. I think that's probably the only get-out-of-jail argument that I can use that seems to gain traction with patients. Is that... Is that fair to say? Yes, so there's nods from the, yeah. the panel, also from the audience, I can see. Um, now then, I have a question from Zoom, and it's from uh, Parish Katari, who has asked the question to Mr. Harry Haran. Good to see you, Harry. Um, and the question is, do you think there's a role for excision of the Haglund's deformity and the increasing use for the use of a speed bridge from Arthrex? How do you feel about that, Harry? Okay, well, that's a good question too. Um, well, that's traditionally what I have done uh, up until the time I came across the uh, Zadig osteotomy. And uh, I, up until the time I read Eve Tunis, uh paper, it was always on a hunch. You know, if you looked at some uh, x-rays, you find that there is a posterior tilt of the, the Hagland, and you can actually see the tendon being physically deformed. And, and those were the patients I felt that they, you know, when I did try and do a calcaneal, uh, you know, resection, you know, a calcaneoplasty by detaching the tendon, putting the, the tendon back uh, with a speed bridge device, that they often came back. Uh, and it was very difficult at that stage to work out, is it the tendinopathy that's continuing to pose a problem? Because I've cleared everything up right up until sort of the, the plantar third of the, the posterior surface of the os calcis. 
Now, did I not do an adequate resection? And I think having subsequently read the uh, the the XY ratio story, I mean, uh, some of the pennies dropped, and I felt that there is now an objective way of working out if the posterior aspect of the oscalsis is too far posterior as a morphological variant. And so in those situations where I actually find that the tendon is pushed back, and you can even see this in a plain x-ray, you can see a shadow of the tendon. Uh, that's the, the occasion where I tend to do a Zadig. But if there is, and very often, I, I honestly don't believe that the Hagland has actually got a major role in creating the symptoms. And I think it's tendinopathy, which is the, the main issue uh, that's causing the pain. So it's not impingement pain as we know it. And I think something has to impinge the tendon in order to cause that pain. So there is a subtle difference in how the, the morphology affects the presenting clinical uh, uh, symptoms in the patient. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think it does, Harry, thank you. Um, while you're on the line then, I'll ask you a question myself. Um, and that is, you're doing an osteotomy, you're changing the mechanics and the, and the anatomy of the foot, but how do you deal with the intrinsic changes that uh, are there within the tendon itself? Because that tendon can be hugely inflamed um, and you're kind of dealing with it indirectly, as you mentioned. Um, sometimes these patients do come back with persistent problems with the inflammatory side of the tendinopathy. How do you deal with that? Uh, again, <clears throat> I, I can't put a, a, a science to it, but in, in almost all of the patients who uh, uh, underwent this operation under my care, a, 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 you know, the, the one consistent uh, feature was that they didn't have a significant amount of inflammation. All of them were ultrasounded. They didn't have a significant amount. There were some patients with some neovascularization. But interestingly enough, following the, the osteotomy and, uh, and a recovery period of about six to eight weeks, uh, the, the swelling of the tendon decreases, the, the painful symptoms over the tendinous uh, insertion decreases. And I can only presume that there are two reasons for it. One, if there was impingement by the posterior superior prominence, I have decreased the pressure on the tendon from that prominence by anteriorizing it. But I think secondly, and possibly a much more important reason is I've relaxed the tendon by elevating the tuberosity. And I think that's probably the reason why uh, the, uh, uh, the symptoms improve. Now, they have there was a, a, a patient or two who came to see me with some persistent symptoms because one of the things they said was, oh, I can still feel the bony lump. And I said, well, look, just ignore the bony lump. Are you hurting? And when you actually delve into it, they were more concerned that it might hurt them because they've still got the bony prominence, but it's further forward anterior. I have had one patient where I've had to go back and debride them. And I felt on review of my x-rays that I probably didn't excise enough wedge. That's very helpful. Thank you, Harry. So um, I'm going to carry on in order of the talk. So my next question is again from me, um, but please do feel free to come and ask your questions. And it is to Tricia. And the question is, has the nature of your forefoot surgery changed over the years that you've been doing rheumatoid surgery, potentially as a result of the DMARDs? For me, very little. I probably do slightly more... Uh, joint preserving surgery but we still see a lot of very very deformed and very uh, arthritic joints but I do think it, it has across the country and I've chatted to our rheumatologists about this and they feel the whole disease process is changing it isn't just DMARDs that rheumatoid is changing if you talk to hip and knees yes they've changed completely out of all recognition but I mean I've done three four four arthritis this week I mean I, I see loads of it um, although having said that, most of this week have been more reconstructive. So I probably do more reconstructive, um, but I still do an awful lot that are grossly deformed. Now, whether we've got a slightly different population that present later, I think we probably have, in all honesty. Uh, but I know that, you know, talking to other colleagues around the country, they do hardly any room to afford for surgery now. Uh, so I think it's a bit dependent on A, your patient population and when they present, and B, how aggressive the rheumatologists are with the with early particularly the anti-TNF, et cetera. Because I do think that it changes it um, because you get on top of the finalitis much earlier on. 
Thank you, Trish. Um, you're, you're on the hotspot still, actually, because Mr. Uh, Katari has also asked another question, and that is this. Um, is there good evidence for doing excision of the base of the phalanx as opposed to excising the head in inflammatory arthritis with complete dislocation of the lesser toes? Uh, no, in terms of evidence, there's no evidence one way or the other specifically, and it comes down to, uh, I think, an experience. I've predominantly done uh, proxophyngeal excision. I've, I've, I've done both in the past, but I find from what I've seen that I think your long-term results seem to be better, but we haven't proved that because it's not, not a big enough study. We started one about a quarter of a century ago in Bristol. I just never quite ever ever came to a came to an answer and that's the problem but there isn't there isn't as far I mean there was years ago um uh, there, were, there was a a, a a uh I think it was um Ian Stockley up in uh Sheffield that, that reported on best after heavy decision but that was before Stainsby had popularized his technique which I think is different to, to a standard just a basic proximal finance decision without yeah. without uh, an extensive chance to no. I think Manishi's about to. Um, Manish, you have a question. Come and join us. And... Well, first of all, lovely to see you all on screen. Um, you could not come. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Trish was mentioning about the study, and actually, our unit is perfect because Trish does things with I excise metatarsal mm -hmm. heads, and we've talked about it so many times. So it's it fantastic. It. Numbers are not great. The rheumatologists they are getting better. So I think we do less and less operations, so it will be very difficult to prove. But I have a question for Dishan. In fact, two questions for Dishan. Uh, Dishan, first of all, have you seen any chronic, uh, almost complete rupture of plantar fascia? And if so, how do you deal with that? And secondly, you talked about various indications, and I think that they're quite nice how to deal with different types of plantar fascia. But is there any role of shockwave therapy for partial tear or um, uh, of plantar fascia? So, thank you, Dishan. Uh, to answer your second question first, I don't think uh, the evidence for shockwave therapy generally is poor. In fact, we, we've been collecting data prospectively for a number of years, but the, the evidence is poor, though generally it works. For a tear, no, I don't, I don't know of any evidence that shockwave therapy works. Uh, sorry, what's your first question, Manish? Uh, the first question was uh, chronic, uh, almost complete rupture of plantar fascia. You did mention about acute tear of plantar fascia yeah, acute, yeah. Acute, uh, in plaster, but how about the chronic ones? They're almost invariably from repeated steroid injections uh, in, my, in my practice. And I think once that happens, I don't know a solution apart from insoles. I don't know a surgical solution. So it's appropriate insoles. And as you know, what happens is the foot flattens and collapses and you get lateral pain. Uh, uh, most of the time, we end up having lateral calcaneo cuboid pain. But apart from insoles, I don't know of any solution personally. Um, question for me How on earth did you get to Mauritius? <laughs> oh, well, it's a dream. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dream for me, too. I live in Sheffield. Um, I'm just I having my rum and dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> Dishan, do, do plantar fibromaticals heal pain? Not in my experience. No. Okay, because I think that's a, a common uh, thing that comes up is, is the um, plantar fibroma debate. But um, yeah, I agree with you. I can see that Harry's got his hand up, so I'm going to ask him for a, a question here. Uh, thank you, Mark. This is another question for Dishan. I was, I was interested in your... Uh, your comments regarding the plantar fat pad, Dishan. Um, it's interesting you say that, you know, plantar fat pads can atrophy if you walk uh, long distances on hard surfaces or you wear hard shoes. Do you, do you have any evidence for that? Because I'd be very interested in it because 
you know, it doesn't stand to reason. You know, I come from a country originally of 1.3 billion people, 80% of them either walk barefooted on pretty, pretty hard ground, as far as I can see, because most of India is now, you know, it's got roads in it. Uh, and the, and I just wonder whether the corollary is true, is that because people are wearing shoes almost all of the time, uh, that they, their fat pads become somewhat redundant and vulnerable to atrophy, simply because they're wearing shoes, cushioned shoes all the time. I'm trying to see if I can, uh, we've discussed this with a couple of surgeons in India to see if we can have a comparative ultrasound study. I, I just wonder whether there is a different sort of arrangement of the fat pad or different um, osmotic pressures in the fat pad in, in the unshod population. Good question, Harry. There is a paper from uh, someone in Thailand and I can, if you email me, I can email you the reference but there's someone in Thailand who did a nice study. What he did was he took weight bearing radiographs of patients who had inferior heel pain and patients who didn't have inferior heel pain. And he found that on weight bearing, uh, those patients who had inferior heel pain had less cushioning. So he drew that conclusion. Uh, that's what I, I can base myself on. Uh, and I suppose a lot of it depends what you walk on. And, but there's a nice paper from that chap. He did a nice study. Thank you, Thank you Harry. Um, so I, I think there's a question from the audience for you, Dishan. Um, so we can please come to the microphone and ask it. So we'll take this question now. I think Rick Brown's got a question for you. So there's lots been written about the natural history of heel pain. What's the current literature? Would you tell patients it'll take a year, two years to get better? Or there is change in the natural history of heel pain? No, I think the, the, answer, the, the literature would tell you that 85% of patients get better but they don't get better straight away. They, they might take up to 18 months. So the key is to tell the patient that they'll, they'll get better, it will take time. But I think I've got to be in my bonnet here because I think towards the end of my talk, I was telling you that what we call plantar fasciitis is actually many diseases, fasciosis, inflammation, and so on. And I think, that, well, the future for young guys listening is to categorize inferior heel pain. There are some that are inflammatory in nature that you'll probably get better quickly. There are some that are degenerative in nature that will take longer. There are some that is bone edema that will... We currently do blunderbuss therapy. We do everything to every inferior heel pain. And in fact, I think it, it takes you up to 18 months to get them better. I think the future is, uh, to use uh, uh, the term from Oxford, is to do a la carte treatment. Uh, but current literature would suggest 85% get better. But it, it takes time. I think the keys to tell patients it take time, takes time. Dishan, can I ask you another question about injections around the plantar fascia? About 20 years ago, I was taught by a very, very learned teacher of foot and ankle surgery, uh, Dishan Singh, and I was taught we were never to inject around the plantar fascia. In those 20 years, we've now got knowledge. We know that injections into the plantar fascia and below it, it was a 3% rupture rate. We now have MRIs and we have ultrasounds much more available. And I was interested to see that the learned teacher was suggesting we can inject into information that we see deep to the plantar fascia. How much inflammation do you have to have to justify an injection now? Rick, I don't know. I think all I would say is I've mentioned it because I, I don't, I rarely do injections of steroids and I think it's very rare, but I think I was trying to emphasize that if you do inject, you must inject above. So no, I haven't gone mad. One more run. 
Yeah, one, one more for you from Mr. Sakalario. So um, put your helmet on. <laughs> Sorry, Dishan, it wasn't a question to you. Actually, it was in response to Rick's question. So uh, I do inject uh, the origin of the plantar fascia now that we have imaging. Uh, and I do it when I know that the patient has been diligent with all the stretches and non-operative interventions that I have advised. And if I can trust that patient and they have been diligent and yet they cannot get over the hump to allow them to be efficient in those stretches, I'll get an MRI, localize the maximum point of edema and inject that point. And that gets them over the hump. And I stress, this is not the cure. This is just like delivering a nuclear dose of ibuprofen to one spot in one go. It will predictably ease your pain and it will come back if you don't persist with your stretches. So under those circumstances, I do it and I guess I do five or six a year because of that. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm suspicious that there are people on the Zoom that are, are wanting to ask questions. You're going to have to type in your question in the Q&A bit rather than try and raise your hand in the participant bit because I can't interact with you that way. So I would urge you to use the Q&A section. Um, in the meantime, I'll carry on with the questions um, from me. Uh, and the next person up is Rick. Um, what do you think about the Jones procedure in the adult population? Do you think it's any good? Yeah, no, I've, I've used it effectively in teenagers and adults. And I find it effective. They can get a bit of stiffness, um, but uh, I find it effect very effective for the claw hallux. So no dif difference in outcomes, do you think? Just a bit more stiffer, just a bit stiffer. Okay, I think Rajesh would like to ask you something. Hi, uh, Rick, uh, if you do a tibialis posterior transfer to the front of the foot, do you do an FDL to reconstruct that tip post or not? Uh, no, um, I would just use a tip post alone. And um, even with um, you know, long-term studies of the patients that Paul Kukta has done, very few have patients have gone into secondary flat foot after a tip post transfer. So primarily just tip post through the interosseous membrane. Rick, there's always a, a worry when you have someone with a cavus foot shape and you're thinking of the calcaneal pitch and um, the trainee asks you, and I think it's always a very valid question, um, why are you elongating the Achilles? Are you not at risk of creating a calcaneus deformity? Can you, can you enlighten us on that question? Um, I think it's, it's about the balance and uh, not elongating the tender Achilles too much so as to keep not to run the risk of that. Um, and of course, the other tricks you can do with the calcaneal osteotomy, you may avoid the, uh, the Achilles lengthening. If you shift as part of your, uh, your valgusization, you can shift the, the Achilles uh, with its attachment up a little bit so you can combine the two and avoid doing both procedures. Lovely, thank you. Any other questions for, for Rick on Cavus? Because it is complicated, yeah. Someone from the floor, do come and join us on the microphone. Um, this question is regarding the tendo Achilles ruptures. So what is the length uh, which actually defunctions? So how much do you say it's the lengthening which causes the defunctioning of the tendo Achilles in ruptures? So this is more of a question in the Achilles rupture, is that Absolutely. what you're asking? Yes. In other words, what is tolerable in terms of the amount of length in, yes. compared to yes. function? Manuel, um, you've come in early here. I'm going to pass that question over to you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I, I'd like first to express my thanks to Manish and all the editorial team. That's, they've, they've been a great job with the, with the book. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a, a possibility to actually measure uh, elongation. That's a problem. And in terms of function, it depends actually on the patient. It doesn't, uh, I, I found very, a, a big range of differences between the same amount of uh, excessive dorsiflexion and function, depending on the type of patient, occupation, and age. And that, that's again a concern. The, the problem is that if we cannot measure elongation or, or or non-elastic tendons, uh, how can we get back to planet treatment for them? 
And that's, that's my concern. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty lost in that because uh, we all know how to deal with a read rupture, but how can we deal with a, uh, an elongation? Uh, do, we, do we think to take all the non-elastic tissue away and get a, a turn down or a, or a BY advancement or, or a transfer? Uh, but then again, how can we actually measure that? How can we uh, get the right um, tightening of the tendon or the right measurement to come back to normal function? I believe we, I cannot give you an answer for that. The, the thing is that in most uh, most uh, active patients, they don't tolerate well when they have a, an elongation. Elongation is anything that causes dysfunction, not being able to do a single heel rise test, for instance. And, that's particularly frustrating in, in athletes, obviously. So to, to, to summarize, and I agree with you, it's not about length, it's actually about function, isn't it? So it depends on how functional the patient is beforehand. And um, while you're on the uh, line there, Manuel, I've got a question for you. Do, do you use ultrasound in your practice when you're um, managing your Achilles tendons, particularly if you're using it for non-operative management? Um, not really. Um, and most of my patients uh, well, are operated, I'm afraid. Um, I do MIS, uh, I do MIS surgery and the local anesthesia and, and do functional uh, early weight bearing, protective early weight bearing for most of my cases. Um, occasionally I use ultrasound in, in cases of uh, high ruptures close to the uh, myotendinous uh, um, junction, which I do treat conservatively. Uh, but in, in the tendon itself, I, I just try to go um, operatively. Um, I, I believe that some, most of my patients are young, young 60, 50, 60 year old young patients who still want to be active. And then most of them are not that compliant. And I cannot have direct supervision unless I supervise them myself. Because uh, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, we don't have a, a powerful uh, physical therapy around us. Be able to supervise them, and the, the thing is that if they I don't supervise them, they get free of pain and they start doing too much exercise in in that gap of time, which uh, I we can have an elongation. That's my big concern. That's that's why I'm very much reluctant reluctant to go into conservative business for most of my patients, unless they're non-active uh, patients or, or, or older patients. Any other questions at all for uh, Manuel uh, Anthony? Hi, Manuel Anthony. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, is the reduced uh, re rupture rate and lengthening of the Achilles tendon with surgical treatment due to the surgical treatment per se, or do you think it's due to poor implementation? and supervision of uh, functional treatment? I believe that uh, it, is, it is the second factor. Uh, apparently, the only thing that gives you that, that actually surgery have an impact on the patient is post-operative pain and worry of having been operated. But the, the, the fact is that the elongation and problems with functional rehab comes later in the post-op regime or the post-op treatment. So I don't think surgery directly affects the, the number of elongations or dysfunction, uh, but rather um, uh, lack of supervision, lack of compliance uh, from the eighth to the 12th weeks. That's my concern. That's, that's the period in which I try to insist patients not to, to overdo, not to overstretch and, and get to, to just doing plant reflection. And I tell them that there's no worry with uh, dose reflection. No, none of them will actually lose dose reflection uh, but I tell them not to, to, to dose flex at all uh, during that period of time. Manuel, there's another question here from Deb. Hi, hi Manuel. Nice uh, hi. talk. Um, when is it too late to do a primary repair after a rupture for you? And when are you thinking? Think, thinking yeah, that, uh, primary repair. Um, uh, if I am doing that MIS or mean invasively or percutaneously, 15 days is the, the, the time gap uh, not to have uh, scar tissue or fibrous tissue, um, which are, is actually uh, not allowing you to, to get uh, gap ends. Mean 
uh, and then if I, uh, until around three months, I find particularly easy to have a mini open repair uh, with the crackle suture and doing an end-to-end -end repair with uh, no other techniques. So 15 days for the acute mini invasive and three months for the mini open using a crackle, crackle suture there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next topic, which was, um, I've got a question for Sentel on ankle arthritis, and, and that is, why do you think osteotomies are less often employed in the UK uh, compared to their proponents in the European and US settings? What do you think the difference is? I think um, we may have lost Sentel, actually, so um, we'll park that one. Uh, question for Venu. Lovely talk, uh, as always. Um, how do you cope with compliance issues with um, diabetic patients with these massive reconstructions? Thanks, Mark. Uh, that is really, really challenging. Uh, it's really critical that uh, uh, when you're dealing with um, acute, sharp foot, uh, limb threatening deformity presentations, are uh, those that require you know, established sharp or deformity uh, surgical correction. It's really critical that you have a, a, a larger and wider multidisciplinary team. And these patients, most of them, in addition to peripheral neuropathy, most likely have got some degree of central neuropathy. They don't really retain information, not all of them, some of them. And you need a team that keeps persevering with the, those important messages. So yes, we are very fortunate to have a large team of podiatrists, diabetes food practitioners, uh, diabetologists, and the rest of the surgical team members who keep reinforcing uh, the same information to the patient and the family members. So, but it is really uh, critical. But another slight advantage with this end stage uh, shock of food presentation is that um, the self-selection of these patients is that they want to retain their limbs. They want, they, 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 they opt for functional limb salvage. And quite often when they reach that kind of situation, they tend to uh, follow our instructions better. But some things are absolutely mandatory, such as you know, smoking cessation and certain improvement in the sugar control uh, and so on. Thank you, Venny. Um, I'm conscious that we've only got about three or four minutes worth of uh, questions to the panel. We've got, yeah, gentlemen here, come to the microphone, please. So how often you address tarsal metatarsal joint instability while treating hallux valgus? Okay, so that depends on whether the patient has hyperlaxity or has got a high beta score, uh, along with the tarsal metatarsal instability causing the hallux valgus. Those are best served with the tarsal metatarsal fusion. That way you'll be able to stabilize the first ray give them a stable first ray and the recurrence rate are much lower. There's subtle tarsal metatarsal instability in some patients who are not generalized hyperlax. Those can get away with a osteotomy type of procedure, but you need to be doubly cautious about that. If you were to err, I would err towards a tarsal metatarsal fusion. Yeah, gentlemen again from the floor. I'll make this the last question from the floor um, and then we'll start to close. It's regarding the syndesmotic injuries. Uh, in your talk, you said if there is a small posterior malleolus fragment, even that can cause, sig or that causes significant disruption of the syndesmosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you do a CT scan, you wouldn't be able to see the posterior tibia fibular ligament. So shall we fix every small posterior malleolus fracture? If it extends into the incisura, then yes. The likelihood is that it's disrupted quite... If it extends into the incisura, then yes, because it's likely, likely that it's disrupted a lot uh, of the uh, PITFL. I mean, has there any publications on yeah. this? Yes, Lyndon Mason. I, I had it on the, on the, on the things. Actually, several, two or three. Okay. Um, one burning question for me, um, and it's a comment first. Hero, what a fantastic talk. Um, as you can tell, you kind of took 
all my thoughts out of my head and I couldn't think of a question straight away. But I have thought of one because I thought it was brilliant and it has made me think. Um, how does the Fibonacci sequence work with the head of the talus articulation? Does that still hold true? Yeah, I, d I didn't look into that actually because I mean, you, you, theoretically you can take the Fibonacci sequence and you can actually look at all various parts of the bodies. And actually it's one of those things that the more you look, the more you find. Um, so in specific answer to your question, I didn't, I didn't actually look at that. Um, but actually it's, it's prevalent throughout the whole body. Um, so even when you look at the toes, the, it's, the same with the, it's the same with the finger. I mean, that's well known, isn't it? You know, you've got 1.618 between the proximal phalanx, middle phalanx. It's the same with the toes, um, the relative width of the first metatarsal to the second metatarsal. Um, so that's a project for somebody to do map the whole body and find all the Fibonacci sequences in the human body. That would be amazing. You know, there'll be more, more of that than the bones in the human body, I bet you. Fantastic. Yeah. Look, in the interest of time, I, I know we have another hand up in the audience, but I'm going to move on with the programme. I really would like to thank uh, all of my colleagues who have spoken today. Uh, they've been really eloquent pre presentations. I've learned a lot. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your questions. They have been very informative and have challenged the uh, panel too. Um, so without further ado, um, we will move on to the uh, speech by our guest of honor um, and the book launch. Why don't, why don't we have a round of applause actually for everyone's questions and talks, thank you. So, Thank you very much indeed. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's nice to see and hear old friends. It's a long time. Um, it's been great. And uh, you sort of, you've all been in our bunkers for the last couple of years. And actually now it's great to, to hear you all talk. And you know, I've learned some things, which is absolutely marvelous. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be asked to be the guest of honor, of course. Uh, and uh, it's been a really interesting afternoon. Well done for everybody keeping the time. I don't think that's ever happened at BOFAS. I think we'd be finishing about half past seven. So <laughs> well done, everybody. Absolutely magnificent. Um, the word doctor includes the Greek etymology, I understand it, for I teach. And it's one of the great things about medicine is teaching people, bringing on trainees, whether they be registrars, fellows. And it was a great honor to have Manisha as my as my fellow in the dim and distant past. And it's absolutely marvelous that he has now come to the situation that he's teaching me and, and writing this eminent book uh, with all of his colleagues. I completely understand how much work this is. It's an absolutely extraordinary effort. Uh, well done Manish and well done all of the contributors. These things are extremely hard work undertaken in the middle of the night, I understand. They come at the expense of the family and your friends and your fun. So well done. Teaching is central to what we do. And uh, it's a great honor to have uh, brought Manish to this or helped bring Manish to this, this, this position. I think it's a great book, actually. It's really interesting. I think there's that valuable gap, isn't there, between the very basic texts that my previous colleague, David Dandy, wrote on, you know, the, the uh, preclinical text for, 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 for medical students. And then we've got the very highly detailed text at the, the, other, at the other end with Roger Mann and all of those sort of Charlie Saltzman huge texts that are very, very difficult in a reference book. So this, this, just, this essentials book just fills that gap for the, the registrars, the fellows, and maybe the new consultants and gives you that evening before you're gonna do something or you're stuck in the clinic and you can go and look at. So I think it's a really, really useful book I've really enjoyed reading it and, and thanks very much indeed for producing it. I'm sure Manish has done this only for the money. Um, I do understand this is really the best paid work out there or, or, or maybe not. I mean, it really, it's, I don't think it's gonna make, you, gonna make you rich Manish. I'm sorry to tell you that now, it's probably too late, but it just, it's just not the deal with, with, with medical publishing like this. So well done, it's gonna, it's gonna hopefully bring you satisfaction and it'll certainly bring you fame and if not fortune. So I suppose it comes to me to launch this book. It's a little bit like launching a boat and I was trying to think what is the appropriate sentiment uh, for launching a book. And I could only, only think really, I think three things. Firstly, I, I wish you an absolutely huge circulation. I hope you sell many copies. 
Secondly, I wish you massive wealth on the back of this, although I think it's probably going to be buying an ice cream and not a Porsche. Uh, and I suppose one has to use that old Thesp saying, break a leg. So well done, congratulations, and I hereby declare the book open. Thank you, Fred. Fred, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, um, I'll hand over to um, Manish Bhatti himself for the reply. Well, thank you so much. It means a lot, Fred. Um, never thought 13 years back that uh, this moment will be that I'll be sitting here, you'll be sitting in Cambridge. And uh, you know you'll uh, do this. So it 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 has been uh, fantastic working with you. Haven't seen you for such a long time. And uh, as you said, uh, this is a great opportunity. In fact, uh, this meeting I was speaking with people in this uh, place, Marriott here, and this is the first uh, meeting they have done um, uh, in the pandemic. And the guys were so happy. And it's really nice to interact uh, people. Uh, live uh, we were thinking of uh, whether to do the hybrid mode and we we sort of experimented and and i'm really um, glad that it's gone swimmingly well and all of you who have attended here and people who have come on zoom have enjoyed the fantastic lectures and thank you the av team you've done a great job because obviously it's always the worst nightmare that can happen um, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, and we've, we've, we've done really so well. Now, I, in my pre-recorded speech, unfortunately, I forgot to mention two authors uh, who have taken the time off. So, Manuel, I saw you on the screen. Uh, you are in Madrid, and uh, thank you very much for all your support, uh, what you have done. You've done two brilliant chapters in this book. And uh, thank you very much. And the other one is Rick. Rick, I'm really sorry. I, I forgot to mention uh, in, the, uh, um, in my pre-recorded speech. The other thing which I wanted to do is wanted to thank personally two people. Uh, I, I knew they were coming, so I, 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 I've reserved it for this moment. Uh, Nick Nanavati has been, he's, he was our fellow, and he is, I've never seen a person who is more enthusiastic, more energetic. Uh, he is, is, is fantastic and I, he'll do really well in future. So Nick was the driving force who really pushed me. And if Nick was not there, I probably wouldn't have done this. So thank you so much, Nick, for, for, for helping me out. The other person I want to thank uh, is Anthony. Anthony is, is the person with eagle eyes. And I've seen, you know, Anthony can see the uh, crack in the wall, whereas other people are admiring the beauty. So he is the one which I used for the quality control. So he went through a lot of chapters with me and looked and really dissected the chapters out. And, and I think with, with, with Anthony's help and effort, the quality of the chapters has become even higher. So thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you so much for coming here today. Uh, lastly, um, thank you all for joining us today, um, those who have come in person and those who have given their time on Zoom. Uh, please, those who are here, please um, visit the sponsors if you can. Thank you once again, JAMO, Joint Operations and Nafield. So if you can, please do that. And um, for those who are listening to us from uh, on, on Zoom, we'll say goodbye to them. And the ones uh, who are here with us will raise the glass and we'll have drunks, drinks. And then the most important aspect, which I've been looking for to have a couple of drinks here with friends and colleagues. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>